thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, for my colleague francophone. Merci d'être ici, c'est un plaisir. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the virtual anesthesia machine. While this is being set up, how many people here actually know about the virtual anesthesia machine simulation? So actually most of you don't know, so I'll spend a bit more time explaining what it is. So these are my standard disclosures. I have funding from industry and federal government. I also collect royalties from three different products that are commercial. So we'll talk a little bit about VAM. And then we'll talk about the lessons learned from VAM and the legacy of VAM and the future. Um, so how did VAM start? It's an online interactive simulation. I've been teaching the anesthesia machine to the anesthesia residents at the University of Florida since 1992. And I could tell they, could, they didn't understand after I explained it to them how the machine works because it's a black box. So we decided to open the black box and we created the virtual anesthesia machine to teach the residents. And then the software platform we use, which was a director, we realized we could put what we had developed on the web with very little effort and we decided to share it and we decided not to charge for it because we thought this was patient safety and it was important to make this available to people irrespective of their ability to pay. Thank you. We, we went through this, so this is working as, as intended. That's good. So this is the virtual anesthesia machine. It's online. And let's see. So essentially, I'll walk you through it. This is your oxygen pipeline, oxygen flush valve, oxygen flow meter knob, nitrous, the tanks. And it's the color code is, is for US. I can change that later. Vaporizer. Then you have your CO2 absorber, inspiratory valve, airway pressure gauge, the lungs, expiratory valve, selector knob, manual system, pop-off valve, APL valve, bellows, ventilator, scavenging system. And everything is interactive, so I'll do a quick demo. So I'm going to purposely, so there's a, a pulse oximeter running in the background. I'm going to purposely put only nitrous oxide and you'll see the hypoxic guard kick in. Watch the green knob as I turn up my nitrous. And you can see the green knob is turning to give a minimum of 25% oxygen. Conversely, if I'm a novice really trying to kill the patient and I turn down the nitrous, uh, the oxygen, the nitrous will follow as it does. I can turn on my vaporizer and I can hit the flush. And I can, if it's important, most of the time it's not important, you're just looking at the needle moving up and down. But if it's important for you to see what is the pressure, you can uh, flush your valve and look at your peak airway pressure as you squeeze the bag. Obviously, you can also turn on the ventilator. And this is, you can see, it's an old style ventilator. Some of you here will remember, you would have to turn the ventilator on and also uh, flip the selector knob. And because I was talking without ventilating the patient, I got an SpO2 alarm. So this, this simulation keeps you on your toes. All right, so we, we got the ventilator going, so now I can chat a bit. So essentially, that's the, the virtual anesthesia machine in a nutshell. Uh, I can uh, adjust my APL valve. I can adjust all the ventilatory setting. A lot of people have talked about ventilatory setting. I to E ratio, tidal volume, frequency, inspiratory pause, and also the pressure limit. Uh, and then in the bottom, it, can, it shows you the phases of inspiration. So if I put on some inspiratory pause, now you can see I have a pause represented in yellow. And this helps you to understand how what you're doing changes how the machine works. The gases are color coded. Uh, and represented by uh, little molecules, which are color-coded. And since we're in Europe, let's do it the right way. And let's use ISO. As you can see, there are eight, eight different, uh, six different gas color codes, seven, uh, six different gas color codes available. So now we are in, uh, in ISO, and then there are 23 languages 
And all these languages, all these translations were done by native anesthesiologists. If somebody liked it and said, I want to translate, but I'm not an anesthesiologist, we politely declined the offer because we wanted a domain expert to translate it. And this was all done pro bono. So since a lot of you have not seen it, I'm going to actually run a, fail a failure and we'll all try to solve this problem together as a team. So I've already started the failure. It should, the symptoms should appear in about 30, minutes, 30 seconds to a minute. And it's like they say in anesthesia. Oh, well, there we go. There's already an alarm. And the alarm is telling me my FiO2 is 16. And of course, I'm going to turn it off. So everybody's blood pressure goes down. Dr. Gravenstein, J.S. Gravenstein, always got upset with me if I left it on, especially if the SpO2 was low, because he had a, 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 a gut reaction to these, to these tones. He didn't like it. So I always turn it off now. Anyway, we have an issue. We have an inspired oxygen of eight. And I showed you earlier my hypoxic guard was working, right? No, my hypoxic guard was, remember I was demonstrating it to you when I turned up my nitrous, my oxygen followed. When I turned on my oxygen, my nitrous followed. Yes, the oxygen pressure is fine because if you look, if you look here, the needle is up and here you can see it's down. So the cylinders, it's zero, but the pressure, the pressure in the, in the pipeline is good. Stuck valve? I don't think so, because if you look here, let, let me turn off the alarm, please, first. Uh, if you look here, my valve is working with the bellows. Oh, I can turn it up. It's not an issue. Uh, I was doing low flow. Everybody was talking about low flow. I thought I would not risk putting a high flow. I would be thrown out of the room, so I made sure it was low flow. Very good. So what would you do? Okay, we can't teach. We can't teach anything to. The bobbin went up because we, no, the, he said there's no oxygen. Actually, there is oxygen. There is gas, but it's not oxygen. I'm sorry. Sorry. Let, let, let's. Yeah, there is no oxygen. There's something else, right? And and because we can't pull anything on Dr. DeWolf, I will ignore his first advice, and which is to, to take off the pipeline. Instead, I will open the cylinder, which is what all my residents do. So I'm going to open my cylinder, and as I open my cylinder, you see the pressure went up. But exactly, now I have a, this continues to drop. And why is that? Why is the, the opening this does not work. Now let me show you the gases again. This is what we have. The gas that is in the cylinder is not flowing because this is reduced from 2,000 PSI. I'm sorry, I don't have the SI units. From 2,000 PSI to 40 PSI, and this is 50 PSI. So as long as you don't disconnect the pipeline, as Dr. DeWolf advised, you are this close to saving your patient, but not, not there yet. And this, is, this happened for real in the United States. The last time it happened was 2002 in New Haven, Connecticut. And the sad part is it took two deaths for them to find it. The first death was on a Friday of an older lady, and they thought she died because she was old. She died because they, they had replaced uh, oxygen with nitrous. And then on Monday, a younger woman was killed, and that's when they found it. OK, so that's the virtual anesthesia machine. And as you can see, the features are, you could see the pipes, it's interactive. It's focused on the anesthesia machine. And this is something we learn you doing VAM. People give us a lot of advice, but luckily we stayed very focused. We didn't go and simulate the patient, right? Because you have to stay focused on what you're trying to teach. And we didn't want to teach about the patient. 
we wanted to teach about the anesthesia machine. So of course, there's a set of lungs. There's a beeping tone for the pulse oximeter, which is necessary. But we didn't go and simulate uptake and distribution and all that, because that was not the purpose. So, so we often hear of the term mission creep. So that's one of the things we learned with VAM, is to say no to mission creep. Stay focused on what you want to teach. And we already talked about it being translated and the faults. So what did we learn? So we, we, we have this, people liked it, but we didn't know whether it was effective. So what did we do? We created a study. And for the study, we created the opposite of the virtual anesthesia machine, which is this machine. So essentially, it's exactly the, the, the virtual anesthesia machine, except it's opaque. It's photorealistic. You cannot see behind the front of the machine, just like a, a real machine. So I can do everything similar. Okay. I'm just showing you this. This was the control group for the study. They used this machine because it, you, they couldn't see inside the, the, the they used this simulator because they couldn't see inside the machine. And this was published. So my colleague, Ira Fischler, is a cognitive psychologist. I work with him. And basically, when you go through the table, it showed that people who use the virtual anesthesia machine with the transparent reality where they could see the gas molecules, they actually uh, did better at understanding the machine than those who used the other simulation, but everything was opaque. You could only see what you see externally. But this was true for only about 95% of the users of the virtual anesthesia machine. And what we learned from that was that the simulation reaffirmed for us what educators always tell us. Not everybody learns the same way. People learn in different ways. So if you have only one way of teaching, there is going to be a group of students that will not do well with your, if you have only one way of teaching. So, so what we did is we identified that, those, that small minority were people with spa with, who were spatially challenged. They didn't have good spatial ability. These are the same people who they, they go, they drive to a place three times. They still need a map the fourth time to go there because they can't memorize space and time. So what we did then is we created another simulation based on that. And this one helps those spatially challenged. It was especially helpful to those who are spatially challenged to, uh, to view, to, to transpose what they learn from the anesthesia machine, from the virtual anesthesia machine, screen-based simulation to the real machine. So this is one of the study participants. She's a psychology student. And she's looking at the machine. And this was before the days of the iPad. So she's going to pick a tablet. And the tablet has tracking um, those silver balls, or tracking modules. And when she puts it in front of her and the absorber, she sees a cutout. The abstract concept of the absorber is displayed on the magic lens. So that it's as if she has x-ray eyes. In addition, when she tries to do the, the adjustment of the knob, now she does it by directly controlling, turning that knob. Instead of doing it like I was doing by turning the icon, she's actually going to turn the real knob, and the bobbin will float up on the, on the simulation. So this is, this is a, a simulation that was very uh, successful. Uh, and uh, we obtained a six-fold improvement in machine fault detection from anesthesia-naive subjects. These are the psychology students. If they said their parent is an anesthesiologist or they know about anesthesia machines, they were not part of the study. And, uh, the group that had the magic lens, they were able to detect a failure in the anesthesia machine six times as quickly, at six times more than those who train on a regular didactic material. And I'll show you a video of that, which is also uh, nice. So she has another co-ed psychology student. 
what we did is we took the leaf on the inspiratory valve out and she said the leaf is missing so that's not the the the, the key part of the study and the audio is not bad which is why we have this transcript this is the money line coming here now so what do you think that does so the leaf is missing in the inspiratory valve it's not unidirectional anymore this this girl 34 hours before didn't know an anesthesia machine existed. Now, not only did she pick up that the valve has a missing leaflet, when we say, what does this mean? She says, it's not unidirectional anymore. So we thought that was pretty impressive because some of my residents would probably not have come up with that answer. <laughs> so, so we've already gone with the rare failures. That's what we also found. So when, that, uh, when the inspired oxygen went down, Many people, because it's so rare, like the last one we know in the United States in, in the United States is 2002, they, they, they never suspected the line uh, did not have oxygen, but something else. What we also learned is we had a purely philanthropic model, and that was not sustainable, unfortunately. We did have funding from WFSA, thank you, and also Drager and, and multiple other industry. But over time, uh, there was a lot of changeover in the, in the co different contacts we have with industry. And over time, we sort of lost the funding. And, and what we also found out is you have to have funded manpower and resources to keep up with IT technology. On the positive side, what we also found out is crowdsourcing was very powerful. You know, now it's a very uh, in vogue term, but those 23 anesthesiologists who translated for us and gave us all the local content. So that was crowdsourcing, because we cannot be in 23 countries at the same time. And also, a lot of what we did obviously had faults. We, our knowledge is A, not encyclopedic, and B, not always correct. So it was a given there were errors in what we, we designed but the crowd would come back to us and say, this is wrong. And then if we went and did the test and agreed they were wrong, we were able to fix it and put it back on the web, correct it. So what, uh, what, are, what is the legacy of VAM? Uh, Drager saw the simulator we built, and at the time they were getting ready to launch what is called the uh, uh, Fabius GS. And that was quite, at the time, a big, uh, gamble for, uh, for Drager because I think many of you here probably know of colleagues or may have said yourself, you'll never take my bellows away from me except from my cold, clammy hands. <laughs> right? so, so Drager basically took on that challenge and it built an anesthesia machine without a bellows. And uh, so they asked us to design the simulator for them and, uh, and we did. And now this is distributed by Drager uh, to, to everybody who buys an, a, a, a Fabius GS. And it's very similar, as you can see, to the... Uh, and this is also available online. Okay. So I won't go into it in, in detail because of time. It's just to show you what's available and that we don't... It's not simply... It's a simulation of a bellows ventilator, but we also have simulations of piston ventilators. Um, these are the ones, I'll, I'll go through them if there's time. Um, so what we also learned, uh, because we were doing the simulation online, Drager never needed to travel to Gainesville, where the University of Florida is, where my lab is, to inspect or review the simulator for the Fabius GS we were developing for them. We were just putting the simulation on a dark link. Only Drago knew where it was. It had a password. They would pick it up, look at it, show it to all the engineers in Telford. Then they would call us and say, this is the changes we need. So that was, that was actually very efficient. It also taught us to do what we can with what is available. Because when Drago first came to us, they said, we want this. And we said, it will cost you 3x. They said, we have only x. I say, if you have only X, you will give you X divided by three for what you wanted. And they said, okay, that will work. So we built a very minimal simulation for them, and then it was successful. 
and then they, they came back with more funding and added more features as time came. Uh, another thing we found out is one day when we were building the simulator for Draga, they called us and said they had a focus group, they're going to change some, I rearrange the way the user interface is, and they explained it to us over the phone, and within three hours, we had the new user interface implemented and online, and the engineers were looking at our simulation on the University of Florida website to figure out how they would code theirs. But to be fair, they had to follow GMP and uh, good documentation practice we don't on a simulator. And it was also a visual optimization tool, because what I forgot to show you is if we go back to the VFGS, is the way it was originally set up is uh, if you look here, originally the, and let me turn the, the ventilator on. Originally the way it was set up, the, the CO2 absorber was here and the bag was here. And, and, and when we looked at it, it struck us that this was inefficient because when you, when you squeeze the bag, um, hold on a moment. Actually, this is, this, is the, this is an old version, I think. I'm getting a bit confused, but bear with me. So you can see here, if I squeeze the bag, I'm going to push some gas. Let me, let me do it, actually. Yeah, but uh, the way the, the piston works is you, the ventilator uh, can be left on while you do the, the manual bag. But what I wanted to show was this. When you squeeze the bag, you're going to push gas through the absorber that's going to go into the scavenging system. So you're going to clean gas that is not going to be used by the patient. You're going to clean it of CO2. So I think in the new system, this is here now, so that when you squeeze the bag, you only clean the gas that's going to the patient. Because when, when you squeeze the bag, if you watch what I do, the gas goes both ways, right? So, so that was what I, what I mean by a visual optimization tool, because we could see the gas flow with our eyes without needing fancy equipment. So the, I'm also going to talk quickly about the VAM website. Um, so we, as I said, we had industry and foundation sponsorship. The way it worked, the sponsorship, uh, we were looking at every time somebody used it, we got one visit and multiple hits. Before we were reporting hits and then we realized hits was a, we were being deceptive because somebody, if they come for four hours, they could create 200 hits by clicking on the multiple elements in the simulation. So in the end, we were looking at one visit, one pair of eyes. Uh, I already talked about the errors on the VAM website. And, and, and so to facilitate that, to, to facilitate not having to worry that there are CDs burned with errors in them floating all over the world, we only had one version ever, but it was on our server. So that when somebody said something was wrong, we would correct it put the new version with a corrected feature, and within a minute, literally, whoever logs in from Congo, Australia, wherever, they have the latest version. And we never had to worry that there were CDs floating with the wrong information on it. Um, so we already talked about that. Uh, for the future, we are, so currently one of the problems with the website and this is something else we learn, is, and that's why we, I said we have to keep up with technology. Um, our simulations use what's called a shockwave plugin, which, is, which was from Macromedia and now from Adobe. And um, most, most new browsers don't support the Adobe uh, plugin. So therefore, when you go to the website, you may have some difficulty loading some of the simulations. And it requires entire recoding of all the whole portfolio, about 42 simulations. So we're working on exploring different options to uh, bring the portfolio back where it's compatible with modern browsers. And since in the read, uh, uh, in the document that was on the chairs, it said I would talk about 
the uh, oxygen, I, I threw this one in at the last moment. This one is really more to teach about not, not using oxygen indiscriminately, and I think I won't get pelted here because I kept hearing that all through the day today. So this is more in a, for example, in a PACU setting. So this is a patient on uh, an FiO2 of 21, and his SpO2 currently is uh, 98. So she's at room air, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to take his FiO2 up to about 30. This is simply a simulation of the alveolar gas equation. All right, so I've got him at 30. So this is a patient who just got into the PACU. Automatically, I just put a nasal prong and dial 100% O2 at three, two, three liters per minute. And now this patient has some residual anesthesia. So I'm going to take his uh, PACO2 from 40, accelerated time to let's say 65. And you can see at that kind with, with uh, an FiO2 of 30, the patient is hypoventilating. His PaCO2 is at almost 70, but the SpO2 is fine. So now if I take that FiO2 and drop it to room air, this is what I get. And so we use that to teach the PACU nurses why you should not just put uh, patients on 100% or two if they don't need it. So that's my little uh, thing about the oxygen. Um, let me go back to the other simulations I wanted to show. So this one is a simulation we did which actually includes the patient. And it actually has a feature And I put it in, this is for the Spanish version. And basically, this was designed for sharing plow for the launch of Sugamadex. And then we couldn't use it because it was not approved in the United States. So it was only used outside the United States. But you can pick six different uh, procedures. And then you can go to the OR. And this is your, your patient, and the system is, is booting up, okay? So then it, it encourages good practice, vital signs, alarms, time out. You can scroll through the pre-op chart, and then you can rotate around the room and drag the face mask. And you can see this is inspired by VAM. And you can apply your pre-oxygenation. And we're going to make sure we stop at uh, 60%, Dr. Hedenstener. We won't go to 80%, okay? And so, and then all the time constants, because we model the circuit mathematically, the time constants play out. And this, uh, we can also teach how to do the, the uh, peripheral nerve stimulator. Let me see. Right. So, so then over time, you'll see the, it's all driven by pharmacokinetic uh, dynamic engine. So for example, uh, I can look at the oxygen uh, concentration. Any questions so far? Oh, I, I guess I should reserve the questions for the end, yeah. So basically, I think you, you get the idea. Uh, this is, uh, and then you can pick different airway devices. Right now, it won't let me do that because I've not administered the drugs. So what I can do is I can administer some propofol. Okay, 
So that's a, a panoramic simulation. It can simulate the entire anesthetic procedure, including the airway management. Uh, we use this with uh, beginning residents to initiate them to the sequence of things in the OR, uh, about the timeout, lining up their drugs, um, deciding what airway tools they will use, and, and getting them oriented. We also use it with uh, courses we hold for industry. Um, so I'm going to, to end this one. Um, and, um, and then I'll, I'll close with a simulation of the anesthesia machine pre-use check. This was funded by the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. And this is the 1993 FDA pre-use check. And I'll just show you quickly the first one, which is it asks you to uh, open the oxygen cylinder. On purpose, I'm going to do it wrong. So then it will, re so the, we, we call this a tiered integrated tutor. So the tutor will tell me, you know, you need to click the icon. Instead of saying it in terms of the cylinder, it, ta it, it instructs me in terms of the uh, simulation. And then if I keep struggling, let's say I click here, then it tells me what I click, which was the selector knob, and, and it repeats the, the instruction. And then if I keep struggling, it tells me to review the rationale, why we are doing this, uh, this procedure and the step to check we have enough oxygen if we run out of oxygen. And if I'm really, really struggling, then it shows me <laughs> a picture <laughs> of where I need to click, right? And then, uh, oops. Then if I'm really continue to struggle, then it will, uh, let me see, what can I do next to show them? I'm sorry? It tells you to struggle, it tells you to struggle. Yeah, and now it will, it will actually do it for me, okay? So, so this is the level of assistance we provide so that somebody, because if, so, if a resident is using it at midnight, they don't have anybody to help them. The idea is to have a simulation where there's also the, the assistance so that they are not stuck and saying, why, why am I not able to do this? So it provides gradually more help. So I think that's uh, my 30 minutes. Uh, I will take questions.